glaube, die erste Seite gibt es nicht. Und ähm, im Winter ziehen wir mit Russen zur Deutschland als so ein zweites Dorf. Und wir waren hier heute für eine zweite Lektüre, die ist ein bisschen schwierig, aber das ist eine Lektüre, die wir heute als Teil der Jugendplan Lektüre haben. Und wir haben zwei verschiedene Themen, die wir heute in der Schule haben. Thank you so much, uh, Marta, for your uh, very kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I will use the mic because the lecture uh, is supposed to be uh, recorded. Um, so it's always a pleasure uh, to be back uh, here in Leuven. I mean, a university where I spent, I mean, six years, uh, I think, uh, doing research at the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies. And since uh, I left this university three years ago, I've kept collaborating extensively with the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies on several uh, research projects, including indeed this German network on EU-China legal and judicial cooperation, whose purpose is really to create bridges. And this is what we are talking about. I mean, against the background of a trade war between the US and China, against the background of what you can call a crisis of the post-World War II liberal international order, there is the big question of what will be made of the future of this so-called strategic partnership between the European Union and China, which was established back in 2003. And in that process, it is clear that there is not enough dialogue, that there, that there is not enough emphasis on the legal dimension on the legal aspects of the strategic partnership between the EU and China. And the purpose of this network is indeed to focus uh, on that very uh, legal dimension. The lecture today, I mean, really aims at giving you a kind of overview, a kind of overview on what does Chinese law mean in contemporary China? What are the main aspects? What is the scope? But what are also the very shortcomings of this contemporary Chinese legal system, which is very much the fruit of a process which started at the end of the 1970s when China decided, under the presidency of Deng Xiaoping, to open up to the rest of the world. And in that process, I mean, the Chinese legal system was revised in depth. The purpose of this lecture is nevertheless not really to talk about black letter law. The purpose of this lecture is indeed to understand what Chinese law mean, what Chinese law means in a broader context. In, a, in the context of a specific governance system, China is still a party state, and more particularly to try to understand what, does, what do power, institutions, and values mean, or what are they all about in this so-called new era which was introduced under the presidency of Xi Jinping. So it's very much this idea these days that China is changing under Xi Jinping. And this lecture will also be about the changes which underpin, I mean, this, uh, 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 this new era under 
Xi Jinping. So my presentation will be divided here into three parts. In the first part, I would like to emphasize the role which has been played by the law in this process of opening up and reforms, which started at the end of the 1970s. In the second part, I would like to say a little bit more about a narrative. A narrative which became quite prominent in China, more particularly as of 2013, or I would even say 2014, when the idea of ruling the country according to the law, ruling the country according to the law, has, become a, has emerged as an important political narrative in the political discourse of the Chinese Communist Party. So I would like us to discuss a little bit this narrative and to try to understand why this emphasis on the need to rule the country according to the law became so prominent back in 2013, 2014. Then in the last part, I would like to address what I would identify as the main challenges of the contemporary Chinese legal system from the perspective of the Western liberal understanding of what the rule of law means. So the idea will be here from a rule of law perspective to try to highlight the key challenges faced by the Chinese legal system. So in order to start our journey, it is very important to go back to the end of the 1970s. It is indeed in 1976 when Chairman Mao Zedong passed away that this so-called cultural revolution was terminated. During 10 years, between 1966 and 1976, China was characterized by a system based on the rule of men, on the complete absence of the law, on the complete absence of legal and judicial institutions. It is therefore as of the end of the 1970s that we saw things changing tremendously. And at the heart of these changes, you had one man, or a series of men, including Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping would decide it, together with the leaders of the time, to open up to the rest of the world, to transform China economically, to a large extent, but also politically, to a certain extent. And at the heart of this opening up and reforms process, you had the idea that the Chinese legal system had to be transformed tremendously, that there was a need to revise, that there was a need to reform the Chinese legal system. The idea was to reinstall stability, harmony, if you want to use a Chinese word here, after a decade of cultural revolution. And for that, the law was necessary. Another reason why the law was necessary was also due to the fact that the, at the heart of this opening up and, and reform process, you had the idea of attracting foreign investments. And it is very clear that if you want to attract foreign direct investments, it is important to have legal certainty in your legal system. So it is again also against that background that one should situate this deep reform which started at the end of the 1970s. A reform which I would characterize as having three dimensions. The first one has been the idea of adopting new laws, of making sure that you had pieces of legislation to address all these issues pertaining to the functioning of a modern society. A society open to the rest of the world, a society willing to attract those foreign direct investments. So since the end of the 1970s, we've, we've really, I mean, witnessed a process which you could call, I mean, a law proliferation process in which new laws have been adopted very, very, on, on a very, very regular basis. The second aspect relates to what I would call the strengthening of China's legal and judicial capacity. It was necessary to revise, not to say reinstall, legal education following the Cultural Revolution, more particularly in a context where most, not to say all law schools, were actually shut down in the midst of the Cultural Revolution. So there was a need in a certain way to reestablish a, a, a trend, a, a tradition of legal education in China. At the heart of, I mean, this process of enhancing legal and judicial capacity, there was also the idea of professionalizing 
the judiciary. Professionalizing the judiciary, more particularly in a context where most judges under Mao Zedong were people who had simply no legal training. Most judges were back then, I mean, former military officers who then became judge at a certain point in their career. So it was necessary to professionalize the judiciary and at the heart of this professionalization exercise, an exam, a common exam for those aspiring to become lawyers, judges, or prosecutors was established. And this exam still exists today. The last characteristic, which is, I think, also important to understand this so-called reconstruction phase, is this idea of growing legal awareness. The fact that in the process of opening up and reforming the country, Chinese citizens themselves came up to realize that the law could serve as a useful instrument to make sure that the grievances they might have suffered from could be properly addressed. And they could be properly addressed by this judicial system in the making. So there we really see a kind of shift. A shift to a situation where the law, where judicial proceedings became progressively considered as being a useful instrument to make sure also that some individual rights could be properly appalled by jurisdictions by the Chinese state. How did it work? I mean, it's all good to rebuild, I mean, a legal system, but it's very difficult to start from scratch. So what have been the main sources of influence in this, throughout this reconstruction phase, which started at the end of the 1970s? And as you can see here on this slide, I mean, the sources of influence have been numerous. One which I would like to suggest you should not underestimate is the influence of international law. I mean, international law and China's growing involvement in the dynamics of global governance, in the dynamics of international politics, have definitely shaped to a very large extent the reconstruction of the Chinese legal system. One event or one process in particular had a tremendous impact on the reform of the Chinese legal system, that is China's accession to the World Trade Organization back in 2001. It took 15 years, 15 years, to China to negotiate its accession to the World Trade Organization. A process which was very long, a process which was very difficult also to China. For those of you who know a little bit about WTO law, I mean, you may know that when you want to become a member of the WTO, you don't only have to negotiate with the WTO as an institution, but also with all WTO members who have a stake, who have an interest at you become or non-become a member of the World Trade Organization. So as you can easily imagine, a country, a state so big, as big as China, I mean, drew lots of interests from the perspective or the accession of such a country, drew lots of interests in the EU, in the US, in Japan, in a number of member states of the WTO. And the least that we can say is that the EU, Japan, the US made China go through a very, very tough time to become a WTO member. China had to pay a high price to become a member of the World Trade Organization by signing off to a number of WTO plus obligations. I mean, I don't have the time to enter into details here, but just to say that obviously China's accession to the WTO had a significant impact on the reform of the Chinese legal system in the sense that many domestic laws had to be revised in the process leading to China's accession to the WTO and also in the years that followed. Another, I mean, important source of uh, 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 inspiration which has been used uh, and mobilized in this process of opening up and reforms is foreign laws, foreign norms. If you want to understand the contemporary Chinese legal system, it is very important to recognize the importance of legal transplants. The fact that in the process of opening up and reforms, China has learned from and adopted a number of norms, a number of laws coming from the outside. You will study with Professor Jacques Herbots, I mean, the basics of Chinese contract law. I don't know in, in, if anyone here in this room is from Germany, but for German contract lawyer, I mean, Chinese law of contracts is very, very easy to understand. In the sense that the 1999 Chinese contract law, the Hotongfa, 
is actually very much a copy-paste of the Chinese civil code. For those of you who are interested in competition law, actually it's quite interesting to note that, I mean, the, the, the anti-monopoly law of China, I mean, has as a main source of inspiration the EU rules on competition law. So it is really the EU model of competition law which has been favored over the antitrust system which exists in the United States. So those legal transplants are also very important to understand the nature and the content of the Chinese legal system. But obviously, let's not forget the so-called Chinese characteristics. What is Chinese about the Chinese legal system? Obviously, China has its own way to be influenced by international law. China has its own way to transplant norms coming from the outside. And my advice for you would be, whenever you study a specific area of Chinese substantive law, that you always try not only to understand where do those norms, where do those principles come from, whether we can talk about a phenomenon of legal transplant, but also to try to understand what is Chinese, what is the Chineseness of that rule, to also identify the limitations of this process of legal transplant, legal tra transplant, which obviously always takes place in a particular context. Now, let's forget a little bit about history and let's switch to this discourse, to this narrative, which became primarily prominent back in 2013 when Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party launched a massive campaign against corruption. Corruption has always been a huge problem in China. Being at the time of the empires, being at the time of the Republic as of 1911, being under Mao Zedong between 1949 and 1976, but also in the process of opening up and reforms. And as of 2013, we've witnessed, I mean, this massive crackdown against corruption, not only taking place within China, but also taking place outside China which explains, by the way, why China is so keen to negotiate these days extradition agreements with states all over the world. You can think, obviously, of what happened in Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong is a part of China, but still, in terms of judicial cooperation, you had this world debate and still this uh, um, anti-extradition anti bill movement, which is still taking place in, in Hong Kong. But just to talk about the situation closer to here, I mean, Belgium, the Belgian parliament adopted back in uh, 2000, um, uh, when was it? Um, uh, it was, uh, the adoption was in, uh, uh, in 2016, you had the adoption of an extradition agreement between Belgium and China. Interestingly, this agreement has not been implemented, not enforced yet. I mean, if you are interested, I would advise you to dig a little bit into that. It's quite interesting that the Belgian government has not really followed up. I guess that the kind of political context, more particularly in Hong Kong, explains why it is extremely difficult for the Belgian government these days to affirm or to uh, uh, take the responsibility for an agreement which would indeed, I mean, facilitate extraditions towards the PRC. So fight against corruption. But more particularly, back in 2014, you had, as it is the case on a yearly basis, this so-called annual plenum of the Chinese Communist Party. Every year, I mean, you have a kind of annual meeting of the Chinese Communist Party, which sets the priorities for the year to come. And interestingly, the plenum, the annual meeting of the Chinese Communist Party back in 2014, chose ruling the country according to the law as the main focus of that annual meeting ruling the country according to the law became the focus of this plenum and of the Chinese Communist Party for the year to come. And I just would like to quote here Xi Jinping, who said back in 2014, to construct a rule of law in China, we must persist in moving governing the country according to the law, governance according to the law, and administration according to the law forward jointly, and persist in the, integrated, in the integrated construction of a rule of law country, a rule of law government, and a rule of law society. In a certain way, back in 2014, it appeared that the rule of law 
would be the kind of magical recipe, the kind of magical recipe which would actually help China address some of the main challenges faced by the Chinese society these days. And here, I just would like to quote a news report which was, I mean, released by the official news agency of China, I mean, Xinhua, back in uh, uh, 2014. The idea that all the pains currently suffered by the Chinese economy, ranging from overcapacity, real estate bubbles, risks of local government debts and shadow banks, to restricted growth in non-public sectors and insufficient innovation, could find their roots in excessive administrative interference, corruption and unfair competition, all of which are the result of the lack of rule of law. Quite an, an important agenda setting power, right? When you use, I mean, that type of language. Now, the big question is obviously, to what extent has this narrative been translated into reality? That is, I mean, how has the law evolved? Or how has the importance of the law been impacted in a positive way by this emphasis which was put back in 2014 on the need to rule the country according to the law. Now, obviously, I mean, China has its own understanding of the rule of law, which is called the socialist rule of law with Chinese characteristics. I mean, we don't have time here to discuss what it means in practice. We don't have time to discuss what is socialist, what is Chinese, about this Chinese understanding of the rule of law. But still, I would like us here to do a kind of exercise which aims from a more theoretical perspective, that is the perspective of the rule of law as a concept, to try to identify some of the main challenges. Some of the main challenges faced by the contemporary Chinese legal system from a rule of law perspective. Now, from a theoretical perspective, I mean, I guess that here you've heard things about the rule of law in the last five years, but still it's kind of difficult for you to define what the rule of law is. I mean, it's still difficult for me, I must confess. But to put it simply, I mean, the rule of law means two things. The first is the supremacy of the law, supremacy of the law. And the second is that the government itself shall be submitted to the law. So two components, supremacy of the law and the fact that the government itself shall be submitted to the law. The literature usually makes a distinction between two types of rule of law. A thin or formal understanding of the rule of law on the one side, or a thick or more substantive understanding of the rule of law on the other side. A thin understanding refers to the very basic principles you need to have a so-called full-fledged legal system. And the principles which are usually being referred to are the principles of legality which were developed by Lon Fuller in the 1960s. This includes the need for publicity, non-retroactivity, understandability, consistency, possibility for practical implementation, stability, and obviously the need to enforce the norms. Because it's all good to have nice laws in the books, but if, the law, if this does not translate into law in action, into the proper implementation and enforcement of the norms, the rule of law becomes obviously meaningless. So this is for the thin understanding of the rule of law, which is about the basic conditions to have a legal system. And then obviously you have more substantive understandings of the rule of law. Substantive understandings of the rule of law, which you could describe as including basic principles of morality, a certain ideal of justice. And if you read, indeed, I mean, the definition which was given to the rule of law by the UN uh, Secretary General back in 2004, I mean, at the time, I think it was still Kofi Annan, who was the uh, Secretary General of uh, the United Nations, he makes, in clear, in, he makes it indeed clear that the rule of law shall be consistent with international human rights norms and standards. There is this idea at the United Nations level that the rule of law is not only interdependent, but also closely intertwined with the principles of democracy, with the principles of human rights. So here, as you can see, we are talking about a way more demanding 
understanding of the rule of law, which is not only about formalities, about procedures, but also about a certain ideal of justice which would be compliant with international human rights norms. I mean, this was just to make a kind of brief reminder of what the rule of law means and to remind you indeed of this, of this distinction between uh, a thin, formal understanding of the rule of law and a thick, more substantive understanding of the rule of law. Now let's try, indeed, from a rule of law perspective to identify the main challenges faced by the contemporary Chinese legal system. The first challenge which I would like to highlight here is what can be called an uncertain hierarchy of norms. An uncertain hierarchy of norms. More particularly, in terms of whether the Constitution is or should be at the top of the hierarchy of norms. To put it in a different way, is the Chinese Communist Party itself submitted to the Chinese Constitution? Who is responsible for the interpretation, for the enforcement of the Chinese Constitution? We'll come back to that in a few moments, but we'll see that according to Chinese law, it is the standing committee of the National People's Congress, the National People's Congress, which is the Chinese equivalent of a parliament, and the standing committee, which is made of a limited number of members of this National People's Congress, because the National People's Congress has, it's more than 3,000, what's the exact number? Uh, if there are any Chinese students here in the room, it's more than 3,000, but I don't know the exact number of, uh, indeed, uh, members of the National People's Congress, but there is this idea, indeed, of the NPC having a standing committee, namely a limited group of members of the NPC, having the power to interpret and enforce the Chinese constitution. But we'll come back to that in a moment. Another element which I think is quite interesting to mention here is relates to the actual status of international treaties within the Chinese legal system. For those of you who have studied in uh, some of the many courses of Professor Jan Waters, I mean, I guess that you, it will be quite easy for you to remember the distinction between monism and dualism in terms of different ways in which international law can be linked with national legal systems. According to a monist tradition, international law and national law are actually part of the same legal system. According to a dualist tradition of international law, we are here, we would be here talking about two separate legal systems. The international legal system on the one side and the national legal system on the other side. Which means that in a dualist tradition, there is a need to have implementing measures at the national level for an international treaty to become enforceable. Okay? So there is this distinction between monism and dualism. Now in practice, and quite interestingly, China has not made a strict choice between a monist or a dualist tradition of international law. China has its own way, if I may say so, and does navigate, I mean, and does change, depending on the areas of international law concerned, between something which looks like a monist tradition in the implement of the implementation of international law or more dualist tradition in the implementation of uh, international law. Now, still what I would like to say here is that it is very clear that in one of the areas which might be of interest to some students here in the room, namely, I mean, the implementation and enforcement of international treaties in the area of international human rights law, China is a signatory and ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. China signed but did not ratify the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And China signed and ratified quite a, quite a number of international treaties in the area of international human rights law. Now, it is very clear that for those treaties to be implemented or enforced within the Chinese legal system that there is a need for national legislation. Chinese judges, in practice, 
do not refer directly to those international human rights treaties when making a decision on a certain case. And this is very much in line with, I mean, this political document, which was the first, which is the first ever white paper published by the Chinese government on uh, uh, human rights back in 1991, which made it clear that a human rights system must be ratified and protected by each sovereign state through its domestic legislation. So this is just an illustration of one area of international law where indeed there is a need for national, national legislation for implementing measures adopted at the national level for the treaty to be implemented, for the treaty to be enforceable. I forgot to say, if you have any questions at any point, you should literally not hesitate to uh, interrupt me, okay? Uh, and I will try my best. I mean, I really want us to have some time for discussion at the end, but if you feel like, I mean, you have pressing need for a question or if there is a need for any kind of clarification, you should really feel free to uh, interrupt me. The second challenge which I would like to mention here is what you could call the lack of constitutionalism. The lack of constitutionalism. Until a few years ago, constitutionalism was something which could be discussed in China. You had many law professors in the best Chinese universities who were very open to discuss issues of constitutionalism, to discuss also the difficulties to implement a full-fledged constitutionalism in the People's Republic of China. Constitutionalism has unfortunately become these days one of the many sensitive issues which can hardly be discussed openly in Chinese law schools. A number of professors got into huge troubles simply for engaging with that term. But still, let's try to discuss it here. When we talk about the Chinese constitution, we are talking about the constitution which was adopted in December 1940, 1982. This is actually the fourth constitution since the establishment of the People's Republic of China back in 1949. You had one in 1954, 1975, 1978, and now indeed the one in 1982, which was last amended in 2018. And I will come back to this amendment later on because it is kind of important to understand the uh, what I would call the greater concentration of power under Xi Jinping in the sense that one of the amendments which was made to the Chinese constitution back in 2018 was meant to remove the limitation to two mandates for Chinese presidents. Okay, so this was the heart of this amendment, namely the idea of removing the limitation to two mandates uh, for a Chinese president, which means that in theory, or at least according to the constitution, that Xi Jinping can potentially decide to remain president for life. When you read, I mean, this 1982 constitution, it is very clear that the constitution testifies to a very strong political willingness. A very strong political willingness to change and to reform China in depth. So when you read the Chinese constitution of 1982, it uses also very much this kind of language which was the one of the opening up and reforms process as of the end of the 1970s. We are talking about top priorities such as economic development. Let's not forget that we are actually talking about hundreds of millions of Chinese citizens who have been lifted out of extreme poverty since the end of the 1970s. Hundreds of millions of people who've been taken out of poverty in this process of opening up and reforms in China. Economic development, but social stability as well. Social stability is also one of those kind of overarching themes which you find throughout the Chinese constitution of 1982, with also, I mean, a decreasing influence of class struggle, which is something which is very prominent more particularly when you compare, obviously, the 1982 constitution with the constitutions which were adopted prior to the opening up and reforms uh, process. Now, what do I mean or what can be meant by a lack of constitutionalism? I mean, a professor, I think, was uh, based, uh, um, I'm always hesitant, but I think it's China University of Political Science and Law uh, in Beijing, uh, uh, Professor Ji Weidong, 
as characterized and described, I mean, the Chinese constitution as being a sleeping beauty. Why a sleeping beauty? The reason is that the Chinese constitution does actually include many good things in terms of protecting individual rights. I mean, the whole second chapter of the Chinese constitution is all about protecting certain basic rights. Now, the big issue, and this is why we, Ji Wei Dong talked about the sleeping beauty, is that the constitution can hardly be litigable, is hardly litigable. You can hardly make sure that the rights included in the Chinese constitution will be directly enforced by Chinese courts. There, was, there is one exception to that, but this exception is no longer valid, but I will still mention it here. Back in 2001, you had a case which made many people interested in Chinese constitutional law extremely happy. And the reason behind this happiness was the fate of a young student whose name is Qi Yuling. Qi Yuling was a student, I mean, in China, and something, what you have to, something that you have to know, I mean, uh, if you want to understand the way the uh, academic system in China works, that is that it is extremely competitive. I mean, maybe that some of you will apply for LLM abroad, I mean, after your studies. I mean, in Europe or in the US, we always complain how it has become so difficult to enter those highly competitive LLMs in the US, in the UK, in Leuven, and so on and so forth. But in practice, the competition is nothing. It's non-existent when compared with the huge competition between Chinese students when they want to enter the university. You have, I mean, a highly competitive exam at the end of high school in China, and your results at that test will determine whether you will be eligible to attend or to become a student in the best Chinese universities. The competition is really, really high. And the way it worked for Chi Yuling was the following. She did quite well, I mean, in that test, but she decided to postpone the start of her studies. She, started, she decided not to start studying after taking that exam. But the problem is that her identity got stolen. Another student did pretend at the time to be Chi Yuling, and therefore entered the university in place of that student called Chi Yuling. So this is the whole start of the story. Now, what happened next is quite interesting. That is the fact that the Supreme People's Court, which is the highest, uh, which is the highest jurisdiction, the highest court uh, in China, ruled that Chi Yuling's right to education, as protected by Article 46 of the Chinese Constitution, had been violated. It was the first time that the Chinese constitution was indeed, using, um, was indeed using directly an article of the Chinese constitution, namely a particular right protected by the Chinese constitution to justify one of its decisions. Which led many, I mean, constitutional law professors to be very happy. Wow, the Chinese constitution is now litigable. It's no longer a sleeping beauty. All those rights included in the Chinese constitution will now become litigable. That was in 2001. Now, a few years later, back in 2008, you had a notice released by the same Supreme People's Court saying that according to the court, this case no longer exists. So seven years after the Chi Yuling case, you had a note in a document by the Supreme People's Court saying that this case no longer exists. That was the end of this hope for a transformation of the Chinese constitution from a sleeping beauty into something, a piece of law, which could be activated, which could become litigable. Now, does it mean in practice that studying the Chinese constitution or studying constitutionalism in China is meaningless? Because you will say, yeah, okay, I mean, it's just a piece of paper. If you cannot really use it, I mean, when you are in court proceedings, what is the use of all that? It's meaningless. No, 
Indeed, I think it's very important not to underestimate the agenda setting power of a constitution. Back in 2004, the constitution was amended, and more particularly, Article 33 of the Chinese constitution was amended. Article 33 of the Chinese constitution now includes an article stating that China respects and protects human rights, which led the person who everyone would consider as the father of the study of Chinese law in the United States, his name is Professor Jerry Cohen, who is based at NYU Law School. Just to make a side story, I mean, Jerry is more than 90 years old, and whenever he talks about his early days as a China scholar, he always refers to, I mean, this visit he made to China back in 1972, together with American President Nixon. I mean, he was part of the American delegation who went to Beijing to meet with Mao back in 1972. Uh, 1972, which was the first time, indeed, you had an official meeting be between a US president and uh, 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 the Chinese president since the establishment of the People's Republic of China. And when Jerry is asked to describe, indeed, this idea of constitutionality, or more particularly, this idea of adding articles such as Article 33 of the Chinese constitution, his answer is always the same. The Chinese Communist Party is creating its own nightmare. The Chinese Communist Party is creating its own nightmare by indeed setting the agenda by including certain things in a constitution which might not be litigable, which might hardly be enforced, but still, it's written in there. And I just would like here to take one illustration, to refer to one illustration of what I would call, I mean, the agenda setting power of the Chinese constitution. And for that purpose, I just would like here to refer to an editorial which was published by 13 Chinese newspapers on the hukou system. On the hukou system. Can anyone here in the room explain what the hukou is all about? This household registration system. Have you ever heard anything about it? The hukou system. I know that some people here in the room have already heard something about it. Uh, but do you want just to explain very briefly what this is all about? Yeah, please. So, uh, when a Chinese is born, uh, he will be designated or he then belongs to uh, the area or the city or the town of his birth. And he cannot change that identity easily uh, later on. So if he want to, uh, wants to move to another city to live, to buy house, um, he has to go through some uh, procedures, uh, which can be very hard in big cities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I mean, this explains also, I mean, this household registration system, why, I mean, migrant workers, I mean, those migrant workers, I mean, moving all around the country, I mean, to work in different cities, to work all over the world, is such, a, all over the country, sorry, it's such an important element, I mean, if you want to understand uh, the working of uh, Chinese society these days. This so-called floating population, this so-called floating population of people who decide to work and live in areas where they actually have no rights. By no rights, I mean to have access to public health care, for their kids to have access to public education, and so on and so forth. So the hukou system really conditions what you can get and where you can get it. It's very difficult to know, I mean, how many people are part of this so-called floating population. I mean, several studies have talked about as many as 250 million people. 250 million people would be part of this so-called floating population. Now, there, there have been talks, I mean, in China uh, recently uh, uh, with regard to uh, the need of reforming in depth this hukou system. But I think it is fair to say that today, I mean, the system is still very much in place and that Chinese citizenship does remain still today very much associated to urban citizenship. 
That is that if you want to acquire, to achieve, I mean, some citizenship rights, some rights which you would link to this idea of Chinese citizenship, it's very important for you to see your hukou transformed from a hukou, from a rural area to a hukou in an urban area. So this idea of the need to move towards bigger cities, to get the right to work, to get the right to live in uh, bigger uh, cities. Now, this was just to explain what the hukou system uh, is all about. And indeed, a few years ago, I mean, 13 Chinese newspapers, and I'm not talking here about newspapers such as the South China Morning Post, I mean, based in Hong Kong. I'm talking here about newspapers based in mainland China. Published online an editorial which became well known as the so-called Hukou editorial. And I think that this Hukou editorial is a good e example, it's a good illustration of the agenda setting power of the Chinese constitution. Let me read it for you here. The constitution stipulates that the citizens of the PRC are all equal before the law, that the nation respects and protects human rights, and that the citizens' personal freedom will not be infringed upon. Freedom of movement is an inseparable component of human rights and personal freedom. It is a basic right that the constitution bestowed to the people. However, the current household registration policy, the hukou, has created unequal statuses among urban residents and between urban residents and peasants, constraining the Chinese citizens' freedom of movement. All laws and administrative and local regulations must not contradict the constitution. This is the legal basis for accelerating the current reforms of the household registration system. After a few hours, this editorial was removed from the websites of the 13 newspapers. Still, I believe that it really demonstrates the strength of this agenda setting power that the constitution can have. It might not be enforceable, but still it sets the agenda and this agenda can be captured can be captured by the medias. It can be captured, obviously, by civil society organizations, being based in China or also foreign NGOs, foreign civil society organizations. The third challenge, which I would like to mention here, is the one of judicial independence. That is the one of judicial independence. Judicial independence, or the lack of judicial independence, is indeed still a huge issue. I mean, in China uh, these days, corruption, I mean, the, the weak education of a number of judges, so this has definitely been significantly addressed uh, in the last few years and could actually be, I think, now removed uh, from uh, the elements pertaining to this lack of judicial independence, but public opinion. Public opinion is still today in China, I mean, a factor which can deeply shape, I mean, uh, the decision-making of process of uh, Chinese jurisdictions. And I would like here just to refer to a case which was a hit and run case in the Chinese province of Henan. So what are we talking about here? We are talking about an official of the Chinese Communist Party, which was involved in a hit and run. I mean, the guy was com driving completely drunk. He did hit, I mean, another person was killed in that hit and run. And in the motivations detailed by the court on that particular case, the court concluded that if this person was not sentenced to death, I quote, it would not be enough to assuage people popular rage. It would not be enough to assuage popular rage. And you can easily imagine that in any kind of jurisdiction, being here in Belgium, in the UK, in the US, if a judge were to use, I mean, half of those words, he would have an appeal immediately and the court ruling would obviously be set aside or be annulled. So this is just an illustration of indeed the impact which public opinion can have indeed on court proceedings.
We've seen that in many instances. I mean, for those of you who want to, I mean, uh, uh, conduct more research on that, you you had, I mean, similar a similar situation back in 2008 when you had this whole scandal around uh, uh, milk powder for babies. I mean, the so-called melanin scandal, which was this idea that corp some corporations in China had added a chemical component, I mean, to milk powder to be used, I mean, uh, for babies, with a number of babies getting sick, some of them, I mean, uh, uh, dying because of it. And indeed, I mean, we could talk about trials, I mean, following this uh, uh, food safety, uh, following this food safety scandal, uh, uh, trials which were highly politicized and in which indeed the influence of the uh, public opinion was very strong. There is another element, I think, which is quite important uh, to emphasize here, but I know that you will have Professor Lei Chen from, uh, City, from Durham uh, University, sorry, uh, from Durham University, who will come and teach next week, I think, an introduction to uh, the Chinese judicial system. So I will not enter into details here, but I still would like to mention here kind of an interesting system, or weird system, at least from a European perspective, and that is the existence of so-called adjudication committees. Adjudication committees, which are established by Article 36 to Article 39 of the Organic Law of the People's Courts, Organic Law of the People's Courts, which was last amended back in 2019. And the idea of, this, uh, of these adjudication committees is, I quote, to deliberate and decide on the application of laws in major difficult and complicated cases. So the idea is for those adjudication committees to deliberate and decide on the application of laws in major difficult and complicated cases. But then you will tell me, but what is this all about? I mean, it's a judge or panel of judges, I mean, making decisions on cases. Yes, at the end of the day it is, but indeed in so-called difficult and complicated cases, by the way, those terms are not defined by the law, you have, you may have a number of more senior judges from the same tribunal, we are talking here about judges who do not participate to the hearings, who do not hear the arguments from either of the two litigants, who will be able to give their opinion on, indeed, the application of the laws in such complicated cases. Let me just here refer to a description which has been made of the work of one adjudication committee in a book which was published by Li Yuen, who is a professor of Chinese law at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and who wrote still until today, I think, what is the best introduction to the Chinese judicial system. And in that book, she refers to a description which was made by a Chinese judge of the proceedings before an adjudication committee. And I quote here, a specific responsible judge reports a case orally and even though the reported contents may not reflect the true facts of a case, one can hardly discover or correct them. Some responsible judges take a long time to report all the details without a clear order and members of the adjudication committees, or more senior judges, ask questions repeatedly, which results in protracted meetings. The oral report and the fact that members of the adjudication committee comment immediately, without time to study the case and the relevant laws, means that the quality of the decision cannot be guaranteed. Sometimes, a decision of the adjudication committee is changed later by the same committee. Obviously, I mean, from a rule of law perspective, I mean, this raises, I mean, this raises, I mean, some uh, significant, uh, some significant questions, uh, as you can imagine. Now, still, wh what is the relevance or what is the rationale behind the establishment of such adjudication committees? The idea has clearly been from the very beginning to ensure that the collective wisdom can be used in a way that benefits the case. There is the idea, to put it in a simple way, that you are better off having several judges discussing your case all together in order to reach the best possible decision. 
on a particular case. There is also, there was also the idea that such adjudication committees could also be obviously an important barrier against corruption in the sense that it is obviously more difficult for you to be a corrupt judge if indeed at a certain point in the proceedings you need to talk to the president of your tribunal and more senior judges and explain what's going on in the case you are responsible of. Now, beyond that, obviously, and from a rule of law perspective, this constitutes obviously a direct, a potential direct, this can create obviously uh, some direct interference in the court's final decision without, again, having those more senior judges participating to the hearings, hearing the contra contradictory debates between uh, the litigants and so on and so forth. There is very much a recognition in today's China that this system needs to be revised. A few months ago, in 2019, you had the release of the opinions of the SPC, the Supreme People's Court, on improving the working mechanism of the Adjudication Committee of the People's Court. At the heart of, this, of these opinions, actually, you have the idea that, as of now, court decisions should include a paragraph explaining the ways in which the discussions within the Adjudication Committee influenced the final decision of the judge. So until now, until 2019, there was literally no trace, no explanation on what the influence of the adjudication committee's advice had been in the process which led to the court decision. Now, according to these opinions, there is now the idea that there is a need for a little bit more transparency, a need for the judge ruling on one particular case to refer indeed to what was discussed in the context of this adjudication committee. We will move to the next challenge, which is the one of law implementation and law enforcement after a five to eight minutes break. Thank you.
Have a pen for me? 
Okay, uh, shall we get started again? Any questions so far? Any need for clarification? Huge criticisms that you want to voice now? No? All good and happy? Good. Uh, we'll have time for, um, not everyone is happy, but uh, still. Let's, let's keep going and then we'll come back to uh, some issues, hopefully, and I really hope also to be able to engage in some kind of discussion um, in a few uh, moments. But before we get there, I just would like us to, again, um, go back to our, I mean, um, list of uh, main challenges faced by the contemporary Chinese legal system from, indeed, a Western liberal understanding of what the rule of law means. And I just would like here to clarify one thing. I mean, it's obviously very easy to point and identify challenges and shortcomings when you talk about a legal system evolving or developing in the context of a party state or an authoritarian regime. That being said, I just would like to emphasize, and obviously I don't have the time to do that here, but I have no doubt that many colleagues involved in this course will also do that, that there are also more and more also good practices in certain areas of law. And I just would like to emphasize the fact that this EU plant Jean Monnet network, which I coordinate at Queen Mary and which involves Leuven and a number of other universities is also about sharing good practices. And this is what creating bridges should be all about, right? Identifying good practices, but also creating avenues for critical debates on challenges. This is something I think we have to do as scholars, but also something we have to do, I believe, as citizens as well. So the kind of next challenge which I would like to refer uh, to here is what I would call, I mean, the gap, not to say the significant gap between the law as it stands in the books and what could be described as the law in action between the existing legislation on the one side and the extent to which those pieces of legislation will be implemented or enforced on the other side. And it is very clear that there is a gap, that there is a significant gap between the law in the books and the law in action in, cont in, contempor in contemporary China. And I just would like here to use one example, which is the one of environmental law. China has been criticized for many years for being a bad student in the fight against climate change. Actually, the whole story is way more nuanced than that. And now we have to come up to realize that indeed China is one of the proponents, I mean, is behind indeed and is supporting the Paris Agreement on the fight against climate change while the U US indeed decided to withdraw from that agreement. Now, this is not what I want to talk about here. I would prefer to talk here about the extent to which national legislation in the area of environmental law is actually implemented and enforced at the local level. And it is very clear here that while China does dispose these days of a quite comprehensive and good set of laws aimed to protect the environment, I'm referring here among many things to the 2014 Environment Protection Law, but also the many laws which have been adopted in the last few years, China has quite a comprehensive apparatus aimed to protect, indeed, uh, aimed to protect uh, uh, the environment. And still, and I would like to quote here, I mean, Professor Wang Jin, Professor Wang Jin, who was the head, I mean, he's no longer the head of the All China Lawyers Association's Environmental and Resources Law Committee. I mean, he was also a professor at uh, the Chinese University of Political Science and Law, who described, I mean, a few years ago, the current state of environmental law in China in the following way. Laws without regulation, troops without power, duties without action, in the final assessment, this is the current state of environmental law in China. Laws without regulation, troops without power, duties without action, 
in the final assessment, this is the current state of environmental law in China. So just this idea indeed that if we consider environmental law, that there is indeed a big gap between the legislation as it stands and on the other side, the actual compliance, the actual implementation and the enforcement of environmental norms. There are obviously many reasons for that and I would like just here to mention one. And that reason is the fact that there is very often in China different interests, whether you consider the perspective of the central authority, let's call it Beijing, let's call it the central government on the one side, and local authorities on the other side. The challenge is indeed to make sure that sometimes the good pieces of legislation adopted by the central government will find their way through and will be properly implemented and properly enforced thousands of kilometers away from Beijing in provinces such as Yunnan, Xinjiang, and so on and so forth. All those provinces which are very far away from Beijing. And the argument which I would like to put forward here is the fact that this idea of stakeholders having different interests and sometimes interests talking at cross purposes is a reality which is directly linked to the very functioning of the governance system and more particularly to the very functioning of the governance of the Chinese Communist Party itself. Let's take an example. You are Mr. Wang and you are an official in a small village located in the Chinese province of Yunnan, which is in the, southern, in the southwestern part of China. The Chinese Communist Party is for and foremost a huge bureaucracy. And obviously when you are a bureaucrat, I mean your purpose is to get a higher position, right? Mr. Wang definitely does not want to spend in his entire life in what is probably, I mean, one of the best still one of the most beautiful parts of the country, the Chinese province of Yunnan. His dream would obviously be to be moved at the provincial level, to get a position at the provincial level, or maybe at a certain point to be moved to the central administration, to be recognized, to be awarded a position in Beijing. So there is a need or this kind of intention to be elevated in the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, how do you get there? And here we have to talk a little bit about legitimacy. You may tell me, but I mean, China is an authoritarian state. China is based on a one-party state. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't care about legitimacy. No, it's completely untrue. What are we talking about when we talk about legitimacy? From a theoretical perspective, you can consider that there are different types of legitimacy. Those of you studying in the master in European studies, I know that there are some, I mean, if you can just raise your hand. No, no master students? Oh, okay, I knew it. I mean, you always spot political scientists in the room. I mean, I'm a political scientist myself, that's why I say so. Um, there is, I mean, in the study, in European studies, usually the distinction which is made between three types of legitimacy an input legitimacy, an output legitimacy, and a throughput legitimacy. Typical example of input legitimacy is every four or five years, you get a democratic mandate because you are elected by people. Okay, every four or five years, people get the possibility to vote and to choose those who will represent them in the four or five years to come. Output legitimacy, is related to something different, namely the idea that as a government, as a ruling party, you have to deliver. You have to reach certain objectives. And this is on the basis of those objectives that your, leg that your legitimacy will be confirmed or will be challenged. If you want to understand what is defined as the legitimacy or the so-called legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party, it is obviously not here that you have to concentrate, but this part is still very important. 
the idea of output legitimacy, the idea of delivering on certain objectives. And the Chinese Communist Party does that in many ways. I mean, when you have President Xi Jinping or the Prime Minister saying at the beginning of the year, look, we have to maintain a 6% or 7% economic growth in the year to come, because if not, we'll get into troubles. I mean, if Belgium had a government, which is not the case these days, I mean, we have one, but uh, in affaire courante, but I mean, can you imagine the Belgian Prime Minister saying at the beginning of the year, look, we want to achieve 0.3% of economic growth, because this is something which is more realistic, obviously, in the, in the current European context. And if not, I mean, we'll get into troubles. So this is what we are talking about when we talk about output legitimacy, the establishment of certain objectives, and indeed, the fact that the legitimacy will be confirmed or will be challenged, depending on whether those objectives are achieved. Okay? So in the Chinese context, to go back to our Mr. Wang, it is very clear that if Mr. Wang wants to get a position at the provincial level, that he has certain objectives to achieve. The first one in China these days is still very clearly economic growth. Economic growth. To ensure the fact that China can keep up and keep going with this fast economic growth, which is still very much identified as a top priority. Another element, which is really prominent in that context, will be social stability. Social stability, which means that contestation, demonstrations, shall be contained in order to make sure that through a kind of spillover effect that something which is local does not become regional and does not transform into something national. This is what we are talking about when we talk about social stability. And then, indeed, increasingly, you have the idea of envir environmental protection. When we talk about the protection of the environment in China, we are not talking about voting or not voting for Green Party. We are for and foremost talking about a health issue. I mean, the protection of the environment, the quality of the air in most Chinese cities is a question of health. This is not a question of protecting the environment. But as you can easily imagine, if we go back to our Mr. Wang here, those three objectives are obviously extremely difficult to achieve simultaneously. How do you ensure that this economic growth is still as rapid as it was in the years before, while ensuring that the environment, that the protection of the, that the, the principles of protecting the environment can be improved or can be addressed? How do you deal with, I mean, social instability when indeed you have your fast economic growth, but that the people living down the street, I mean, woke up in the morning with a river which was purple and not blue anymore because of the local factory, I mean, having polluted, I mean, the, the river for many months? How do you reconcile in a certain way all those objectives? My argument here would obviously be that indeed, given the very ways in which officials are being assessed or the conditions for officials to get a promotion have a deep impact indeed on this gap between the law in the book and the law in actions. Because whatever the legislation adopted at the central level, it will be too often in the interest of local stakeholders to deny certain pieces of legislation for their own purposes. In this case, we are talking about getting promotions, getting higher positions within the Chinese uh, Communist Party. So this is just one aspect which I think is quite important to bear in mind if you want to understand the gap which exists between the law in the books and the law in action. <coughs> That's the moment I cannot talk anymore. <laughs>
Okay. Um, sorry for that. <coughs> 15 seconds, please. You always hope for it not to happen, and then it happens. <laughs> okay, my bad. Let's move to the next challenge, if I may. This challenge is the one of decentralization. And in order to illustrate that challenge, I just always think that it's important for you <coughs> to be reminded of the fact that China the second largest economy in the world is made of different realities. It's made of different realities. China is for and foremost made of diversity. And this is something which should not be forgotten. I put here on these slides four pictures. You see the symbol of political power in China, the entrance of the forbidden city, the symbol of the continuity between the imperial times, in the sense that the Forbidden City was the imperial palace during many decades, many centuries in China, continuity between the empire and the People's Republic of China. This is why it's quite interesting in a certain way that at the very entrance of this Forbidden City, you have this picture of Mao. Whenever you have China's National Day in October, the Chinese president, I mean, who stands, I mean, in his car, is leaving the Forbidden City. So it's literally leaving the palace under the eyes of Mao to go to the rest of the population. So there is very much this idea of sustaining or pretending that there is a kind of continuity in Chinese history. And this is, I mean, a very strong symbol of, uh, uh, of uh, the political power uh, in China. Here you have a picture of the Pudong, Pudong area in Shanghai, which is really the financial district of Shanghai. Picture taken on the uh, Karakoram Highway, Karakoram Highway, which connects the Chinese province of Xinjiang with Pakistan. And this picture was taken in a uh, Tibetan area in the northern part of uh, Yunnan. As you can easily imagine, I mean, the life in those four areas, the everyday life of people is extremely different. We discussed a little bit the importance of mobility in today's China, the importance of migrant workers, but still the reality in those different regions is obviously extremely important. And this existence of different realities also explains why, I mean, on the one side, China is definitely based on a highly centralized governance model, that's for sure. But decentralization also plays a tremendous role in a number of areas of governance. And this is very clear when you think of the functioning of the Chinese judicial system. While all the courts, all the Chinese courts in China are under the authority of the Supreme People's Court based in Beijing, all civil servants working for those courts are appointed by local people's congresses, by local parliaments. So while you have a highly centralized judicial authority, the judicial system itself tends to be highly decentralized. This is the case of the judiciary, but this is also the case in many other areas. I mean, just for us to, to use that word once here in this lecture, if you think of the world developments linked to the coronavirus crisis, I mean, the coronavirus crisis is yet another example of the tension which exists between dynamics of centralization on the one side and dynamics of decentralization on the other side. It's very interesting to see, I mean, the different ways in which the central government has engaged with the local government of the city of Wuhan, which is the place in southeastern China where the world epidemic uh, started. We see there real tension. First of all, the epidemic was described by the central government as something which the local government of Wuhan had to deal with. The next thing the central government did was to send a senior official from Beijing to Wuhan 
to reassure people that things were under control. I mean, this same senior official, I mean, contracted the disease and is now sick because of the coronavirus. Then we ended up indeed in a situation now where the central government had to get involved, more particularly in view of the need indeed to engage with the international community in the context of the World Health Organization. I mean, I'm happy to go back uh, to that in the Q&A session if you are interested. Um, in the sense that China's engagement with a global health governance is one of those areas of law where China has always been very, very active. But again, if you want to understand indeed those kind of tensions between centralization and decentralization, I guess that the world coronavirus is a good example, a good illustration of uh, that uh, tension. The last point which I would like to mention here, and before we turn to the, uh, to the discussion, hopefully, is what I would call the turning point. The turning point which the party state is now facing. Xi Jinping himself, I mean, back in 2017, described the fact that socialism with Chinese characteristics has entered or would have entered a new era. And the question which I would like now to discuss with you is what is meant by this new era on the one side and what has been the impact upon the law of this so-called new era under Xi Jinping. Let's first try to understand why such a new era was necessary in China. What led Xi Jinping to argue that indeed China is now entering a new era? The first aspect which I would like to mention here do relate to China's domestic governance. To the fact that China is now at a very important turning point when, where many, I mean, domestic challenges are concerned. Challenges that pertain to the relationship between economics and politics. How can we keep going, how can we keep reforming China's economy without reforming more in depth the Chinese political system? What is the sustainability of this rapid economic growth? China has been extremely successful in ensuring, I mean, a very fast economic growth, but to what extent is this sustainable? And here, I obviously go back to the need of environmental protection, environmental protection, which has become an increasingly important uh, issue, I mean, in China these days. And also an ex another example of challenge is the one of how to address the high level of income inequality and economic disparities in China. I mean, I mentioned the fact that hundreds of millions of people had been lifted out of poverty throughout the process of economic and uh, of opening up and reforms, but still now we witness those huge gaps, those huge economic gaps between cities and more rural areas, between the eastern coast and the most remoted areas in the West, and the big question is how to deal with that. In that sense, it was very much perceived that the get decade of presidency of Hu Jintao, so the one who was president before Xi Jinping, was very much of a lost decade. A lost decade during which many of those challenges, I mean, described here, were not properly addressed. And in that sense, Part of this narrative on the new era is based indeed on the recognition that there is a need to address some of those issues. Now, obviously, I mean, Chinese governance, governance I mean, does not evolve in isolation of broader, I mean, geopolitical dynamics. And it is very clear that China now needs to make sense of what can be described as a crisis as a crisis of the post-World War II liberal international order. A crisis of the post-World War II liberal international order in which basic values, such as the rule of law, human rights, and democracy, values which are actually founding values of the European Union, according to Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union, are now deeply contested. And when I refer to this contestation, I'm not only talking about China contesting those values, I'm talking about a number of states in Europe or in the United States contesting 
those values upon which, in a certain way, the post-World War II liberal international order was founded. And for those of you who study EU law, I'm sure that you will hear at a certain point, I mean, references to situations of rule of law backsliding in member states such as Poland, Hungary. I mean, the list is actually becoming longer and longer. I mean, you can add now Romania, increasingly the Czech Republic. So just to say that this contestation does not only come from the outside of this liberal order, but also very much from the inside. And the big question is obviously, how will China respond to all that? How will China respond to those numerous internal challenges which I've listed here? And on the other side, what will China do out of this crisis of the post-World War II liberal international order? What will China do of the stalemate in the United Nations Security Council? What will China do of this uh, uh, complete, I mean, uh, 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 stalemate, I mean, in the appellate body of the World Trade Organization? which is now no longer functioning. What will China do in a context where, I mean, mega FTAs or mega, I mean, investment agreements such as the TTIP, the TPP, I mean, are increasingly contested in Europe, but also in a, in a number of states all over the world. What will China do all, uh, what will China do out of that? few answers, and again here, those answers are really not comprehensive, but I just would like to highlight here some aspects which I think are quite prominent in this so-called new era uh, under Xi Jinping. I want to make it clear that some of these elements which I mentioned here should be seen in continuity of what existed before Xi Jinping came into power, but some of those aspects can be seen as either being reinforcing dynamics which pre-existed, I mean, the president, uh, the, president Xi Jinping, uh, the president of Xi Jinping, or even some kind of new dynamics. But let's, let me go uh, to them one by one. Xi Jinping new era, I mean, clearly signifies an increased concentration of power. An increased concentration of power, more particularly in a context where the system, until, until Xi, and since the beginning of the opening up and reforms process was very much based upon consensus. Since, since 1949, China has always been ruled by one party, the Chinese Communist Party. But throughout the process of opening up and reforms, we only had one party, the Chinese Communist Party. But the main decisions were still based on consensus. You may have a single party, but still have very different streams, very different opinions within the same party. That is definitely the case of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, it is very clear that under Xi Jinping, we have witnessed a concentration of power, which you can also describe as an increasing, uh, 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 um, uh, what's, what's the word here, personification of Chinese leadership. The leadership has become increasingly personified, which is something which had disappeared in China. It did not have that under Hu Jintao. It didn't have that under Jiang Zemin. This is something new, which has come back in a certain way at the forefront of Chinese politics under Xi Jinping. We've also seen the adoption of a number of new laws in China in the last few years, laws which are aimed to protect the so-called national interest. And as lawyers, I mean, as you all know, every time you see national interest mentioned somewhere, this is something which it, you, you see the red light there, right? Because obviously it can have a significant impact on the, on the independence of the judiciary and also on the good functioning of the legal system as a whole. Let me just list here some of these laws which have been adopted. The 2015 National Security Law, the 2016 Cyber Security Law, the 2016 counter-terrorism law, counter-terrorism law, which is actually the kind of legal basis which China now tries to use to justify, I mean, the opening of uh, these detention camps which have been established in Xinjiang, where you have a population of between a million and 1.5 million uh, a minority, a pe people from minorities being, mus being Muslim minorities or being Kazakh minorities who are put in those detention camps against their will. 
the 2016 law of the PRC on the administration of activities of overseas NGOs is another example of the fact that indeed we can literally talk about a shrinking space. A shrinking space for debate, a shrinking space for the freedom of speech in this so-called new era under uh, Xi Jinping. Now, what has been the kind of impact on the law of all these developments? I mean, Karl Minzner, I mean, talked in an article which was published back in 2015 of a so-called turn against law. This new era would be characterized by a so-called turn against law. What is meant by that? It is meant here that while the law is still recognized as an important instrument to ensure the success of China's reforms, the law at the same time can also be seen as a threat, as a threat to one thing, that is the survival of the one-party state, that is the survival of the Chinese Communist Party. And in that sense, we've seen a kind of shift. We've seen a kind of shift in terms of the role played by law in society, in terms of the value awarded to the law in the context of the People's Republic of China. What we have also witnessed under this new era is an increasingly vocal opposition to the, to the promotion of so-called universal values. I mean, in the readings, you may have seen references to this so-called document nine. Document nine, which is, I mean, an intra-CCP document, an intra-party document, which was circulated back in 2013 which was then leaked on purpose and not on purpose. I mean, you never know with those documents. And in this document, I mean, the, uh, uh, the document nine, does lists what is considered as, what are considered as being ideological perils for the People's Republic of China. One of those dangers listed in that document is indeed the Western understanding of constitutionalism, to go back to what we discussed uh, before. Let's make it clear here, the whole discourse on universalism is something that China has never endorsed. That is not the point that I want to make here. But it is very clear that China has become these days way more vocal in its rejection of those universal values. This is something which you can very much feel. I mean, for those of you who are interested in the bilateral relationship between the European Union and China. This is something that you can very much feel in the context of the annual human rights dialogue organized together by the PRC and the European Union, in which we are really talking about the dialogue at cross purposes, in which we are really talking about the dialogue <coughs> which has become increasingly difficult. <coughs> Another element which I would like to mention here is the one of a crackdown, of a crackdown which has been described as the so-called 709 crackdown. 709 crackdown because this is a crackdown against human rights, about, against civil rights activists, which started in the night of the 9th of July 2015. In the night of the 9th of July 2015, you had a process, which is still ongoing now, in which, I mean, the party state has particularly targeted, I mean, not only human rights lawyers, but human rights activists uh, in general. We are talking about more than 300 people who have been, who have been uh, uh, affected by that, were put, uh, uh, were detained, I mean, without any kind of legal basis. Some of them were tortured. Some of them simply disappeared. They were not the, one, the only ones being affected. I mean, their families was, were affected, and so on and so forth. And the 709 crackdown is still something which is going on now, and which is, I think, another example of indeed the fact that there is very much a shrinking space for debate. A shrinking space to debate, I mean, some issues which have always been very controversial in China. But while until a few years ago, it was still possible to have, in one way or another, debates on issues such as constitutionalism, such as the protection of certain human rights. I mean, such debates have become increasingly difficult uh, these days. <clears throat> 
All these kind of arguments are arguments you can find in this book, which was published by Carl Minzner, I mean, with a uh, Chinese law professor uh, in the United States, who published this very good book, which is actually a very easy read, uh, uh, published by OUP back in 2018. And the title of this book is China's Authoritarian Revival and the End of an Era. So there is this idea that the era of reforming China, of opening up China to the rest of the world would be over, and that we would indeed witness in China these days what he describes as being a revival of authoritarianism. And I don't have obviously the time to enter, I mean, into uh, this debate here, but I would be happy to go back to that uh, during the Q&A session. But you can imagine that China's digital transformation will have and already has a significant impact on the number of dynamics which, I've, which I have listed here. I mean, you've all read things on the social rating system. You've all read things on the fact that China is now really trying to become a leader in the development of artificial intelligence. I mean, the list is quite long. And obviously, I mean, this digital transformation has the potential to have a significant impact on a number of those dynamics. Conclusions which are not really conclusions. Uh, let's call them concluding, concluding remarks. This lecture is, is a very difficult one in the sense that I don't have enough time to enter into nuances. The idea is to create a debate, is to push you to think about a number of issues and also maybe to give you also some kind of theoretic, theoretical tools for you to be able to independently make up your own judgment on the challenges faced by the Chinese legal system these days. This lecture would be completely incomplete if you were not to consider at a later stage some substantive areas of Chinese law. And this is something that you will be doing as of next week. Just a few concluding remarks which I would suggest you keep in the back of your head when studying contract law, when studying property law, when studying human rights law, I don't know if competition law will be covered this year, but anyway, I mean, any substantive area of Chinese law is the following. The first element which I would like to mention here is that I think that it is useful to think of the Chinese legal system as a multiple speeds legal system. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that if you want to understand whether China is getting closer to the rule of law or is getting further away from the rule of law, you have to consider some specific areas of Chinese law. And what you will quickly notice is the fact that in certain areas of law, China is quite good from a rule of law perspective. In other areas, things are way more difficult, are way more complex. Just would like here to use, I mean, a quotation from Don Clark, who is a Chinese law professor at George Washington University in the US, who stated back in 2011, China's legal system is about the effective functioning of governance. So when the system changes, it does so to help governance function better. This does not mean it cannot also develop to better accommodate issues arising between citizens that have little connection to the government, but it does that on the side. The fundamental characteristics of the system stem from its statist orientation. So the idea of the law being primarily an instrument, an instrument in the hands of the power to achieve some political objectives, more than the law be being a tool in the hand of citizens to see their rights protected by the state. Another element which might be useful to bear in mind here is what Libman called the China law stability paradox. This law stability paradox is very much linked to what I said when I described, I mean, Minzner argu Min Minzner's argument on China, China's turn against law. The fact that on the one side, the first side of this paradox is that the law is necessary that the strengthening of the Chinese legal system is something which is extremely necessary from the perspective of the party state. You need legal certainty if you want to attract foreign investments. You need legal certainty if you want to have a fast economic growth. You need to have a, a comprehensive and well-functioning legal system 
if you want indeed to respond to the increasing needs of uh, an increasingly well-educated population and also increasingly rich population. So the law is necessary, but at the same time, the law can also be a threat in certain areas of law. Think of constitutional law, for instance. The law can be a threat to the sustainability of the Chinese Communist Party's power. This is what this law stability paradox is all about. Now there is the question of, is the rule of law narrative, is the rule of law as a conceptual tool useful at all to understand the Chinese legal system? In the early years 2000s, I mean, you had many books which were written and with titles such as China's Long March Towards the Rule of Law. There was very much this idea in the early years 2000s that the rule of law could be seen as a process in which China was very much engaged and that at the end of the tunnel that there would be indeed the rule of law in China. Now it is very clear that this is not what we are talking about in today's China. Some are talking about a rule by law system. Some are talking about the complete absence of a rule of law. So it's also important to bear in mind whether it makes sense at all to use this kind of theoretical tool of the rule of law, which I've been using here to understand what the Chinese legal system is made of. The last two points which I would like to mention here is let's not forget about the time frame we are talking about here. China started its opening up and reforms process at the end of the 1970s. It is not that long ago when you think about it. It is really not that long ago. So let's never forget this time factor, indeed, when we critically assess, I mean, the main challenges faced by the Chinese legal system. Let's be critical. Let's do our work as academics, as students, but let's not forget about this time uh, dimension. We still have 10 minutes for discussion. That's good. I thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for my voice, uh, which is almost gone. And uh, please do not hesitate to uh, shoot your questions now. If you have any questions after the lecture, I'm also very happy to respond via email if you have any additional points you would like to raise with me. Thank you very much for your attention. I mean, is China a dictatorship? I would say China is an authoritarian regime. China is an authoritarian regime with a leadership which is increasingly centralized and personified. That would be my answer, the, the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is whether this is the one of the characteristics of an authoritarian regime which is so much integrated in the dynamics of globalization on the one side, and also an authoritarian regime which, whose population has been at the heart of a transformation which had never been seen in history. Namely, I mean, transforming a Chinese society the way it has been done since the end of the 1970s. I mean, such a big country, this is something which is unseen in history. With regard to the first part of uh, that debate, namely the idea of China being very much encored in the dynamics of globalization, it means that on the one side, China has very much benefited from its active participation in the dynamics of globalization. China would never have become the second largest world economy if it had not become a member of the World Trade Organization back in 2001. China has also become increasingly active 
in a number of areas of global governance, but also in a number of international organizations. The UN Human Rights Council is one of them. So China engages, even with those more sensitive areas of global governance, such as international human rights law, trying to describe or to present what China calls an alternative discourse on human rights. And back in 2017, you had the adoption of the so-called Beijing Declaration on Human Rights, which is a so-called South-South Declaration on Human Rights, putting great emphasis on the right to development of developing and emerging countries, so presenting a kind of in different interpretation of what human rights is all about. So being, having benefited itself a lot from globalization, from its active participation to global governance dynamics, engaging with different areas of international law means that debate has to happen and that there are many ways in which China can be engaged in those, different, in those different areas, being still an authoritarian regime, indeed. Now, the, the other way around, I would say that there is, I guess, a big question mark. It is very difficult to understand the extent to which changes which have happened in the last few years, namely an increasingly an increasing concentration of power, a return towards a more personified, I mean, leadership, are decisions or changes which will work out smoothly. I mean, it is very difficult. I mean, the very idea of amending the Constitution back in 2018 is something which has been silently criticized in China uh, by other streams of the Chinese Communist Party itself. So I would say that this is this was a risky, this is a risky, these are risky moves uh, in a certain way. Um, and, and you actually see now in the midst also of this coronavirus crisis that the whole functioning of China's governance system is criticized. I mean, and I'm not talking here about criticisms only on Western, in Western newspapers, but I'm also talking here about criticisms, I mean, on the Chinese net. I mean, Chinese blocks, uh, uh, Chinese discussion, discussions taking place online uh, in China. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah? Any other questions? Please. That's a very good question. I would say that this is not at all a question of law, but this is purely a question of politics. I mean, what we have, or the, the big question, I mean, in the relationship between China and Hong Kong in the years to come is, I think, the sustainability of the one country, two systems policy. The extent to which, I mean, this one country, two systems policy, which was adopted when uh, Hong Kong was returned to China back in 1997, right? I mean, you had uh, Hong Kong was taken by the British Empire following the first Opium War in 1840-1842 and, and was given back, was returned to China back in 1997. And the idea was at the time to recognize the fact that while Hong Kong is indeed an integral part of China, that there is the possibility and the right for Hong Kong to develop its own system. System based on the rule of law, system based on a certain kind of participatory democracy, and so on and so forth. And now the question is really, I think, the one of the sustainability of this kind of schizophrenia in a certain way between this idea of one, having one country on the one side and two systems on the other side. What we've seen in the last few years was the fact that indeed, I mean, uh, demonstrations, civic activism, were always sparked by some specific decisions or some specific uh, 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 policies adopted in Hong Kong, such as this idea of establishing this uh, extradition bill with the People's Republic of China. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this is literally the tip of the iceberg and uh, indeed, the demonstrations, the, all the debates or criticisms which emerged in Hong Kong 
in this process of discussing the establishment of such a bill is, does not give us the whole picture, does not give us the whole story. I mean, what we are talking about there is also, I mean, a rising influence of Beijing over, I mean, Hong Kong governance, a rising perceived influence of Beijing in Hong Kong, which challenges in a certain way this idea of one country, two systems. So indeed, we are talking about legal systems which are governed by different traditions, the civil law tradition or common law tradition, but I think it's more power politics than the rule of law which will play a role in that debate in the future. We wrap up? Okay, all good. Thank you very much to all of you, and I hope you will enjoy uh, the course uh, for, the, for the rest of it. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick announcement. So the next lecture, we won't see each other again until actually March 23rd. So there's actually over a month uh, of a break somewhere, somehow. Um, so we will see each other again on Monday, March 23rd, because that will actually mark the start of quite an intense and intensive week of Chinese law, um, because that's the occasion uh, when we will have Professor uh, Lei Chun, for now still at City University Hong Kong, but by that time he will almost be at Durham University in the UK, um, and he will deliver five lectures within that one week. So we will have a very intensive week, so do check your course schedules. Uh, it is included in the official uh, Kai Leuven schedule, but also check the Toledo schedule, and you will be kept obviously up to date through Toledo. So we'll see you again on March 23rd.